business. And I'm sure that he wants to save your family. I'm believing he's going to save people tonight as well. Thank God. Turn into your Bibles to the book of Isaiah 49. And we're going to read there in 2022 here in Arizona. Uh, someone won in the lottery a $14.6 million jackpot. Imagine what $14.6 million could do to change your life. It would have helped them if they had claimed the ticket. The rules say you have to claim it within 180 days. The ticket was sold on June 5th. Uh, that meant they had until December 2nd to claim the prize, but no one claimed it at all. The time passed is the largest unclaimed prize in Arizona ever. So that story shows us the truth. In life, there is an acceptable time. If they were to now pull out of a, their sock drawer an old lottery ticket and say, hey, I won, it's too late. You had to do it in an acceptable time. This is never more true than in the kingdom of God. The scripture that we are going to read, God speaks and he says, in an acceptable time. I have heard you want to preach about an acceptable time. Isaiah 49, just one verse. Verse 8, the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. An acceptable time. I want to begin, let's look at that thought of an acceptable time. People make a mistake about life, and they think that life is simply up to us. That the only factors in life are personal. Why do I choose or why do people act in certain ways? Personal preference. I feel like it. I want that. I don't like that. That's not convenient. Yes, that'll work for me. And people think that is actually the basis. They've lived their whole life on personal preference. But now they bring that into relationship with God. Now they come with the same idea, I can get right with God anytime I want. I can get right with God when I get ready. But our text calls this the day of salvation. We may have reasons and excuses why we're not responding to God's offer of salvation. I'm too young. I'm not ready. I got to live first. I'm building a career. I got a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or whatever it might be. I have problems I have to sort out. But the idea in some people's mind is when those factors change, then it will be good for me. Now I can say, okay to God. Is Felix in Acts 24 and 25, he said, he, go away, Paul. He's telling him, he's pressing him about the claims of Jesus Christ. He says, go away and I'll call for you at a convenient season. Right now is not good for me. But Paul, whenever I get ready, then it is that I can respond and get right with God. Some people feel that they can respond and these are now people who have been saved. They think that they can respond and obey anytime they feel like it or anytime they get ready for it. Luke 9, 59 he said to another one, follow me. And he said, Lord, but first let me go and bury my father. His father wasn't dead. This wasn't like he just died in the funerals Tuesday. I can't. No, he wasn't dead. He could be very young, might not die for decades. He's saying the family wouldn't approve. I have to make sure that I take care of all family obligations first. Luke 9, 61. Another one said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. In other words, if the family says okay, 
If everybody else is good with it, then it's okay for me to follow you. So in other words, people make life-changing decisions. People who are supposed to be in relationship with God and the only factor in their mind is personal preference. I'm taking a job. Man, it's a great job. Well, it means I can never come to church because I have to work every Wednesday night and every Sunday. But man, it's a great job. Why would you do that? Because I'm going to make two more dollars an hour. Yeah, yeah, I got this job, but I got to move away. And, but what about your relationship with God? But the benefits, they got a retirement plan as though that is the only factor. So what people think in both salvation and obedience is you can put God on hold. Is there anybody here when you call tech support or you call company, do you like being put on hold? You ever had that? Can I put you on hold, a brief hold? You lie. I have never been on a brief hold. And so, some people think they can put God on hold you know, every once in a while, they've got you on hold. It, it feels like forever. Are you still there, sir? It'll be just a moment. And they think that's God, that God is sitting there. I'm sorting out all the factors of life. I'm getting everything. God, are you still there? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just waiting. But our scripture shows us the truth in life. Life is based on God's timing, not ours. Isaiah 49, 8, our verse, in an acceptable time, I've heard you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. In other words, timing is up to God. He doesn't say, listen, get out your calendar. How is July looking for you? And would you prefer to get right with God now? Or are you still working out some stuff you, how's, how's 2026 looking for you? As though he's just going to wait around. God, he is almighty God, all powerful. He chooses. That's what the scripture says. Our text is, is based, in, and it's interesting, in the prophets. You, you, you see this, this interconnection between heaven and earth. You're reading about nations that are on the earth but it's God making decrees. God is sovereign. He makes choices. There's a Bible word that you read in the King James. That word is elect. Believers are the elect, which simply means chosen. Acts 13, 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were very glad and thanked the Lord for his message. And all who were chosen for eternal life became Believers. Now, Calvinists will take this as though <clears throat> God chooses and you have no choice in the matter. I don't want to be saved. Nope, you are chosen to be saved. Or others, I do want to be saved. Nope, you are chosen to go to hell. That is nonsense. That is not what the Bible is talking about. God makes a choice of what he wants to happen, but we have to respond. And when people respond in salvation... God still makes choices for our lives. Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, I am the apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. God made a choice about his life and what he was going to do. His career. This was calling. God had something very different than what he had planned. God chooses locations. God told Elijah, go to the brook Cherith, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. The will of God has an address. Hey, I'm thinking of moving. Have you asked God? That's a simple question. In my life, I, I am astounded when I think about this. And I've been talking in Sunday school, and we'll get to, I'm going to do another lesson this Sunday of how our family came to Prescott, Arizona. But this was in the will of God. God chose that I be saved in Prescott, Arizona, in this church. He chose that I be discipled in Perth, West Australia. 
and that I would enter the ministry in Perth, West Australia, that we would pastor in several different places in Australia and ultimately he chose, he had spoken to us when we were young teenagers and told us that one day we would go to Africa. That was God's choice because this is what God does. And our text says, when God makes a choice, whether that is salvation or whether that is his will, it must be worked out in God's timing. In an acceptable time, I've heard you, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. So God chooses things for us, certain places, at certain times. And our choices have to line up with God's will. His choice of salvation, you have to make a choice to line up with that. And then a choice of God's will, because if you put it off, it's not just simply that God waits forever until any time you feel like it. In the book, Foreign to Familiar, it tells a very interesting story about a lady, and this, is, this book is talking about culture codes and what culture you're from determines how you view life and, and it tells a very interesting story of a lady she moved to the United States from the nation of Lebanon in an Arabic culture when someone offers something to you you never just say yeah would you like a drink yes I'm thirsty would you like something yes in their culture it is it's polite to refuse. You never say yes the first time. So she moves to America and now she's working not with Arabic people, with Americans. She starts on the job and the first day when it's lunchtime, her co-worker said, hey, would you like to go have lunch with us? From her culture, she says, no, thank you. Because in her culture, they would go, no, no, really, you, why don't you, no, thank you. No, no, you should really, really come. Oh, okay. But she's working with America. Would you like to come to lunch? She said, no, thank you. They said, okay. <laughs> and she said, it was, this lady was making a speech talking about uh, uh, differences in culture. She said, I have been lonely for seven years because I put off thinking that it was just going to be resolved in a short amount of time. Let's talk about missing the moment. In our scripture, it carries an urgency. Our text is actually a warning. If God sets the time and not us, that means it's possible to miss the time of God's invitation, his visitation. Verse 8, thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time, I've heard you. So that means there can be an unacceptable time. That's true of many people. It's true in salvation. God is patient. I, I, I'm just telling you, that, uh, we're, we're rejoicing in Lisa's cousin that for decades put off and refused, but God is merciful. That, that is true, that's one side. But our text tells the other truth, and that is there can be an unacceptable time. Some people put off getting right with God because their assumption is there will be another opportunity. There will be a later time, another chance when I can get right with God. But the problem is you can die and that ends all chances. Luke 12, 20. Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. The old saying is, so many people who intend on getting right with God at 1159 have a habit of dying at 1157. Jerusalem. Luke 13, 34, they missed a visitation. The God of the universe came out of heaven and came to their city. 
offering salvation. But they missed it. Jesus, because he was God in the flesh, he knows that judgment is coming. The Romans are going to come. They're going to completely destroy that nation. Jesus was there then and not another time. Deal Moody, he preached in 1871 in Chicago. He was a preacher, an evangelist. He preached for salvation. He preached one night about salvation and didn't pull an altar call. There's a question sometimes disciples ask, why do we pull an altar call every service? Deal Moody in that service, he talked about the claims of Jesus Christ, but didn't pull an altar call. Instead, he told the people, I want you to think about what I preached tonight and come back next week. But the problem was that night, the great Chicago fire broke out and burned the church he was preaching in or the building he was preaching in. 300 people died in that fire that night, including people who had been sitting in the service. And he said, I will never again end a service without giving an opportunity because you can miss your chance. You can also lose the desire to get right. You know, the desire to get saved, it comes from God. It doesn't come from you. God is the one who, the Bible says, he drew them with the cords of love. There's a pulling. There are people they are pulled upon. There's something they want to get right with God. They want to fix their sin problem. Or maybe it is they're just agitated and and on edge because they know they're not doing it. That is a gift of God. Conviction is a gift of God. But the Bible says when you delay, one of the dangers of that is not simply you could get run over by a bus tonight. Part of the danger, or a more common danger, I should say, is the Bible says your heart can get hardened. You don't have that same desire. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This is the problem. I have known people at one point in their life, they were moved to tears, but they said, not yet. I've known people, they're, they're agitated, they're, they're bothered by the preaching of the word of God, they're under conviction, they're squirming. But give it some time, refusal to obey, and they can hear the best preaching in the world. They just be going, how long is he going to talk? Because the desire has changed. This is true in God's will. God makes choices for our lives. God is merciful. He's patient. I've seen this in, in the love of God that he helps people they refuse to do God's will for a time and God is merciful he doesn't just give up on them quickly but our text is also a warning you know that mostly I preach about how merciful God is and how good he is to foolish people who refuse and disobey but our text says the truth is you can miss the acceptable time the rich young ruler went away sorrowful. I can't do that right now. It's too expensive financially, and there's no record that he ever got another chance. In our text, in an acceptable time, I've heard you. You know what happens to people who delay? I, I know very few people, now I'm talking about Christians. I know very few Christians who will out and out just say, no. <laughs> what do I care, God? No, no, no. What, what we say is, not yet. Not yet is just a nicer way of saying no. You can say, no. Or you can say, no. It's still the same. <laughs> right? Not yet is, no. 
So I refuse, no. I have some things I want to do. I got to work out. But what you find is the factors change. That can be an opportunity that was there is no longer there. Or the factors of life have changed now with age, mortgages, commitments. Now it's harder to do the will of God. You know when Lisa and I first went into the ministry to pioneer our first uh, church, when they came to pack our stuff, it didn't take long. And it did not take a very big truck to pack our stuff because we were young. It was very easy to respond at that point in time. But what happens is the factors change. The truth in life in the acceptable time is you can miss a moment. Stories told of a, a man, he took his friend out for a ride one day, drove out to an uninhabited expanse of land, and this friend began to tell his buddy about all the wonderful things he was going to build on this land. There's nothing here. And he began to tell him about all the things they were going to build. And he said, listen, financially, I can handle the main project, but I want you to understand that's going to take all my money to build, but all of the land around it, he says, you need to buy this land. Because people are going to come here. One day there's going to be restaurants. There's going to be hotels. They're going to be, and if you will buy the land, I'm telling you, you are going to make a lot of money. But the problem was his friend is looking out. There is nothing there. And he is thinking to himself, who in the world would want to put money out in the middle of nowhere? And so... Art Linkletter said to his friend, Walt Disney, I'd have to think about that. And he missed out on an incredible opportunity because he said, not now. Let's talk finally about responding today. If it's true the truth of God's timing. What do we have to do? Number one, respond today. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That is why we have altar calls, not only for sinners to get right with God, but for believers. When God speaks to you, there's something about coming to the altar. You're saying, God, I heard you tonight. I heard you today, what you've said, and I want to do what you want me to do. That is what it means. A real Christian is not somebody who comes to church. Yeah, I could come to church every once in a while in between television viewing and bingo and soccer and every other activity. And Yeah, I, I think I could fit God in on the occasional Wednesday night. Being a a real Christian is somebody, the choices of their lives line up with God's will. Saul, when he was knocked off his horse and encountered Jesus Christ, his response was, Lord, what would you have me to do? In other words, he didn't say, God, I could fit you in on the occasional Wednesday. He said, what would you have me to do? Respond today. Believe God today. Whatever God speaks or prom promises us, sometimes when God speaks, what he is speaking seems crazy. I remember Mike Webb telling me that when he, uh, the, uh, the first time that God ever dealt with him, that he wanted him to preach, he said he literally laughed. <laughs> That's crazy. I, there's no way I'll ever be a preacher. There, there's something about God speaking to us. You have to personalize it. You have to say, God, what you told me, I believe right now I don't feel qualified. Right now I don't see how that can ever work out. I remember Lisa and I, when God dealt with it, we're teenagers. 
And in a Thursday night conference video, God spoke to both of us and told us that one day we would go to Africa. I had no idea how that could ever possibly happen, but we knelt at our chair and we said, yes. God, I don't get how that's going to work, but yes, I believe that you're able to do that. And then we have to act on it today. The will of God involves decisions and actions. Elisha, he's plowing, he's working in the family business that he no doubt will inherit. Elijah goes by and throws the mantle, be like his cloak or his robe, throws it over his shoulders, which was a symbol in those days. God has chosen something for your life. And the Bible says he killed the oxen, burnt the plow. In other words, I am lining my life up with the will of God. Sometimes when people come and they say, I'm thinking of doing this and I have an opportunity to do that. One, what has God told you in the past? And secondly, what God has told you, does this decision bring you closer to God's will or does it make it farther away? You have to choose. Salvation is like that. I was reading about a pastor. He was dealing with a, a young lady. She's very young. And she was arguing, I have plenty of time to get saved. I can respond to Jesus Christ later. And so the pastor handed her a piece of paper and he said, would you sign a statement right now? I'll write it out. Will you sign it saying that I want to postpone my salvation for one year? And then she got nervous. Well, well, I, I couldn't do that. He said, all right, how about six months? You're going to put it off for six months? We'll write six months. I, I don't think I could sign that. And he said, all right, how about a month? And then, then she realized this is, this is foolish because I don't have an assurance of a month or six months or a year. I have what this text says Today. God is putting the opportunity for salvation before me today. And our text says, at an acceptable time, today is the day of salvation. When we respond to God's timing, whether that is in salvation or whether that is in obedience, that releases the power of God on our behalf in our text, the full verse says, in an acceptable time, I've heard you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. you will, uh, I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. God says this is, there are practical benefits. Number one, people who respond, he said, I've heard you. Prayer is not simply, I have a list of stuff I need God to do. Part of prayer is God is looking at our response in obedience. Disobedient people are not the ones who are going to show you their prayer list of answered prayers. But God says to people who respond, I've heard you. Secondly, I've helped you. There is supernatural power released when people decide to get right with God. Supernatural power to change. Supernatural power when people decide to obey and believe God. Circumstances change. God's blessing flows in that. Thirdly, he says, I'll preserve you. In life, as we are living for God, there needs to be supernatural protection. Part of that is God protect us against attacks that may come from outside. They're demonic. They're from hell. But can I tell you something? I know this wouldn't be true for any of you. Greg Mitchell has given me more problems than anybody else in the world. Greg Mitchell has given me more problems than the devil has. So that preservation, I don't just need God to protect me from the Satanists who right now are sacrificing cats with our name on it. <laughs> Part of that is God 
we have a tendency to be stupid sometimes. Is there anybody, is there any people who you'd be honest with? There, okay, there's a few. God, I need you to help me. My tendency can be, I need you to step in and help me to not make dumb decisions. God says, I can do that. If you will respond in areas. I've had areas where I've obeyed, 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 and then there is something that's like, wow, that, but I don't feel right about that. That's God. It's preservation. Fourthly, he says, I can use you. I'll give you as a covenant to the people. You know what? If you decide to do the will of God, it's not just you that is helped. It's true in salvation. I'm going to talk Sunday morning and Sunday school. When people began to get saved, it wasn't just them that got saved. They triggered something. Other people got the benefit. When we choose to obey, other people are blessed. But all of those are dependent on timing. Thinking about thoughts like this, responding in God's timing. Lisa and I have pioneered twice. That means we started a church from scratch once in Launces in Tasmania, which is an island of Australia, once in Johannesburg, South Africa. In later years, we, we had converts, people saved, wonderfully saved. Some of those are pastoring today. I marvel at the blessing of God, but I have asked some of them, remind me what was going on in your life. We just happened. We, we went from Perth, West Australia. That's like where San Diego is. Australia and America are about the same width. It's like going from San Diego to Miami or down the bottom of Florida. That's where Australia is. Thousands of miles. And intersecting with people's life. What was going on in your life that the moment when the gospel was presented, you responded? They would describe the factors in their marriage or different things. And my question was, if we had come five years later, if Lisa and I said, we, you know, we got to take care of some stuff first. Do you think... And obviously, this is speculation. I, I, I understand that. But do you think you would have been open five years later? And what's interesting, numbers of them said, I don't think so. The intersection of Lisa and I obeying God met with the day of salvation in their lives. And the result was they responded in an acceptable time. And God did a miracle in them. That is why our text says, God is patient, yes. But there is an acceptable time. I rejoice when God allows people after a long time of disobedience to get right. Thank God. But on the other hand, there is a day of salvation. And you have to keep both of those Pulling. God is patient so we don't lose heart. But sometimes people miss out so that we don't presume that we have forever. And our text says there is an acceptable time. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes, if you would, for a moment. Thank God. I feel God's spirit here tonight dealing with some people. I don't know everyone here. I don't know how everyone came. But I'm confident that there are people that are here first and foremost, before we talk about anything else, we need to deal with the sin problem. Today is the day of salvation. I don't know whether you wandered in, whether you were invited whether you saw the church online, I don't know how you came here, but I'm telling you, this was an appointment. Because God in love, he wants you to be saved. The Bible says he is not willing 
that any should perish. It's not God's design. He doesn't want people to go to hell. He doesn't want them to be judged for their sin. He made a way that he could pay for your sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He who never sinned didn't deserve to be punished. He allowed himself to be punished in our place. He can fix your sin problem. But what has to happen, there has to be a response. God makes the offer. You have to make the choice in whether or not today is the day of salvation. But this is the acceptable time. If you're under the sound of my voice, I'm telling you, tonight is your night. And I want to know, before we do anything else, how many people are here, you are not right with God, but you want to get right. While I was preaching, some of you are very nervous on the inside. Some of you, there was that pulling inside. I want that. I want to feel what it's like to be right with God, to feel clean. God can do a miracle inside of you. What you need to do is you have to say yes. And if you want to do that, I want you to do one thing. Lift your hand up. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I am not right with God. Lift it up so I can see it. Pastor Greg, I'm not right. I need Jesus. Amen. Thank God. There's a hand there. How many others? I'm not right with God. I want to pray. I'm not offering you to buy anything. I'm not selling anything. I want you to pray. Thank God over here. Thank you. I see that hand. God bless you, man. I appreciate that. You can put your hand down. How many others? Not right with God. I want to get right tonight. Lift up your hand right now. God loves you. He wants to do a miracle inside of you. Some of you are backslidden. Backslider, do not presume that you can just come service after service after service and yeah, someday I'll get right with God. You need to get right tonight. How many backsliders? I need to come back home and get right with God. If that's what you want, lift your hand right now. God's dealing with you. I feel the spirit of God. There's a a tug of war on the inside. Let God win. Thank God. Thank you. Thank you. I see these hands. God bless you. There are people are being honest. Others, you need Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Don't let this chance go by. Don't presume that you'll have another one. You need to respond tonight. Anybody else? Quickly, we're going to ask one more time. Now's your chance. Lift up your hand right now. God would deal with you. You want to get right with God. I want only those people that lifted their hands, I want you to look up at me. Did let your eyes meet mine. Did you mean that? Yes. Just nod your head. Yes. You meant that. You meant that. Over here, you meant that. Yes. Come here. I want you to come over there with someone else. Come here right now. Come meet with me. Someone's going to pray for you. I appreciate that. Thank you. God bless every one of these being honest. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Just kneel down right here at the front. I appreciate it. Thank you for being honest. God bless you, man. Right here. There you go. Thank you. God bless these people being honest with God. They want to get right with God. I want all of you to stand up to your feet right now. If there's somebody near you and that you think they might not be right with God, why don't you help them? Give them courage. Help them to come and to pray. Some of you, God's dealing with you about areas of your life. You need to come and say, God, I'm not going to delay anymore. I want to do your will. The altars are open. You can come. Our brother's going to sing. Surrender all. Surrender all. Blessed Savior, 
I surrender all. I surrender all. Sing it again, I surrender all. I surrender, surrender all. all. I surrender all. To thee, thee my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I surrender all. I surrender. Let's worship God. Let's thank God for His goodness right now. God, I thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of serving you, Lord God. Thank you for speaking to us and challenging us. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Some of you, God spoke things that involve practical decisions when you leave. The job's not done when you leave the altar. There were some specific things that God wants you to put in order. Then do so. Whatever God tells you to do, begin to aim your life. Begin to make decisions that line up with the will of God so that those blessings that we talked about 